Warning, this is a YouTube video. Please do not base medical or life decisions on this or any YouTube video. Welcome everyone to this edition of Chubby Guy Tells You About Obesity and Exercise. Why listen to a shirtless Adonis tell you how to boil chicken breasts and do burpees when you can listen to someone who looks like he stole his degrees in exercise science? Look, you gotta trust me, appearances can be deceiving and that's gonna be like the theme of the video. Obesity has become a national and even global health epidemic according to the CDC and WHO, with major repercussions for morbidity, impaired quality of life, and life expectancy of whole populations. Obesity rates have been steadily growing for the past 50 years and were only made worse by the pandemic, with the rate of weight gain nearly doubling from March to November of 2020. This probably isn't new information to you. Most people know that obesity is a common threat to public health and opinions on the matter are not hard to come by, even from the average person. However, the conversation surrounding the topic is seldom healthy or productive, usually just boiling down to someone saying that fat people need to diet and exercise, which... Congratulations on your astounding insight! You've cracked the code! If everyone just made better choices, we'd have fewer problems! This is not a solution. Literally everyone is aware that diet and exercise are vital components of weight management. The decades of campaigns making everyone aware of that fact don't seem to have worked. This is a way to wash your hands of care about this issue and replace sympathy with disdain. However, I've been seeing more and more people combat this useless approach with what I can only describe as defeatism. Obese people can't help being obese. It's entirely genetic and diet and exercise don't work. Look, yeah, fat phobia is a real thing and health concerns are very often just a mask for appearance-based insults, but you can be body positive and correct at the same time. You don't have to infantilize fat people and pretend that we literally have no control over our lives. Spoiler, I'm not going to solve the obesity crisis in this video. Not even really going to talk about the systemic factors that have led to it. Uh, truth be told, I'm making this video to address just a few common assumptions about obesity and health and why they give a poor framing to approach this issue in the first place. Assumption 1. Is being fat bad for you? Sort of. You wouldn't have the biggest health organizations in the world declaring obesity an epidemic if being fat and having poor health were a spurious correlation with no link between them. However, this leads to probably the biggest misconception people have regarding the topic of obesity. That fat, as in adipose tissue, the thing that makes us larger, is the unhealthy thing. That you can point at someone and say, you are fat, therefore you are unhealthy. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. Adipose tissue is not just a storage tank for extra food. It produces hormones and other substances that have effects on the brain, pancreatic beta cells, the liver, skeletal muscle, and the cardiovascular system. In healthy people, these substances tend to regulate appetite and metabolism, guiding us to a healthy level of fat that gives enough stored energy to survive a significant period of fasting without weighing us down with excess non-contractile tissue. Remember, as far as evolution is concerned, we're still in the jungle trying to parkour our way out of being a Komodo dragon's dinner. However, these endocrine functions can be altered in someone who is obese. In obesity, adipose tissues can become insulin resistant, lose their ability to adequately store triglycerides, which sends them careening towards other organs, and become less able to give off their stored energy. Basically, anytime a tissue expands, it needs more oxygen to function. And to get more oxygen, the body has to build more blood vessels in that tissue. Normally, this is no big deal, and is part of a healthy pattern of storing energy in adipose tissue to release later. However, in a state of prolonged overnutrition, adipose tissue can expand beyond the body's ability to adequately supply it with blood. This creates a prolonged stress signal because now we have all this tissue in danger of not getting enough oxygen, which can create chronic inflammation that in turn puts more stress on other organs and so on. Basically, too much adipose tissue can make problems associated with obesity, like insulin resistance and heart disease, even worse in and of itself. This is compounded by the notion that the substances that adipose tissue produce become less effective as we gain more adipose tissue. Leptin, a hormone produced by adipose tissue, suppresses appetite and increases in circulation the more adipose tissue you have. However, just like other hormones, if you have a lot of it circulating for a long time, the target cells become desensitized and the hormone doesn't work as well. High levels of fat mean that the hormone that suppresses our appetite becomes less effective over time, which makes it easier to eat more and get fatter. This means that for people with leptin deficiency, hormone therapy to replace it can be effective. But for common obesity, it would essentially just be adding more white noise. So there is some evidence to suggest that excess fat tissue by itself can be a health risk. But so can coughing. Coughing, in and of itself, is not dangerous, but excess coughing can cause significant damage to the throat and lungs. So developing a smoker's cough can therefore be a health risk. However, we'd all probably agree that this is better described as a complicating symptom of the far more important underlying cause. Assumption 2. Is the scale a health measure? 
Gaining or losing weight is usually seen as a function of calories consumed versus calories expended. And while this idea has gotten some pushback in recent years due to the sheer gargantuan number of variables that go into either, it's still basically true because of physics. Mass is not created from nothing. But that doesn't mean there's not something to this approach. Too much emphasis is put on the number on the scale as if that's the ultimate goal of a healthy lifestyle, like nothing else matters until the line goes down. This is incredibly counterproductive because significant weight loss takes a ton of time, effort, and consistency. After the first week, it's really only healthy to lose one to two pounds per week at most. If you try to pull some biggest loser style stunt and lose 15 pounds a week, not only is that damn near impossible to maintain for the rest of the life you're trying to improve, but you screw up your metabolism something fierce. A study done on said Biggest Loser competitors found that they lost similarly massive amounts of weight compared to patients undergoing gastric bypass surgery. Since the competitors were also exercising heavily, they were able to maintain far more muscle mass and thus a greater percentage of their weight loss was pure fat, which is a good thing. Under more reasonable circumstances, maintaining that muscle mass via exercise, in addition to the extra calories burned during a workout, helps to maintain a higher resting metabolic rate thanks to the preservation of that more metabolically expensive muscle tissue. You get to keep a bigger engine that burns more fuel. However, in the case of the Biggest Loser contestants, who lost an average of 107 pounds in 7 months during the study, their resting metabolic rate was about as negatively impacted as the gastric bypass group. For both groups, this rate was far less than what would be predicted for someone at that current size. Normally, with weight loss, after a period of adjustment, you can expect to have a roughly similar resting metabolic rate compared to anyone else at your new weight, especially if you've exercised and maintained your muscle tissue. Twelve months after baseline, the gastric bypass group had rebounded and now had RMRs that matched what was predicted for their size. But the Biggest Loser contestants still had significantly lower RMRs six years after the competition was over, even after gaining back about two-thirds of the weight they lost. I cannot overemphasize how much lasting damage this fucking disgrace of a show did to the public understanding of weight loss and health. Not only did it create incredibly unrealistic expectations for how much weight you should lose if you're trying, but when word got out that most contestants gained back most of the weight they lost, it made too many people believe that permanently losing weight wasn't just hard, but a waste of time. All that attention placed on the scale when the number it shows is correlative, not causative, of health. You quit smoking weeks ago, but you still have the smoker's cough, so it must be a waste of time. Assumption 3. Can you be fit and fat? The truth is, it's the things that tend to make people fat, the lack of physical activity and overindulgence in salt, sugar, and fat-laden foods that pose the real risk to one's health. It's much easier to gain weight when you eat the kinds of foods that are more likely to cause long-term damage to your health. It's much easier to gain weight when you don't keep your cardiovascular system strong and your muscles responsive to insulin with regular exercise. It's much easier to gain weight when all of those things become ingrained as lifelong habits. If you fix those things, if you eat your vegetables and practice medieval sword fighting techniques in the park most days of the week, you will be far healthier even if you don't lose a single pound. A meta-analysis on the impact of cardiorespiratory fitness on all-cause mortality in overweight and obese individuals found that not only did fit fat people have similar mortality risks as fit normal weight individuals, but they had half the mortality risk as unfit individuals regardless of weight. Clip this next part. It is better to be fat and fit than lean and unfit. If you are lean and you cannot keep up with a fat person in the gym, they are probably healthier than you. Not only that, but remember those negative health consequences of having too much adipose tissue we talked about? Well, those also seem to be mitigated with proper exercise and diet, again, regardless of weight loss. I'm just going to quote directly from this study. Despite only modest effects on body weight, exercise and ad libitum nutrient-dense diets for overweight slash obese individuals have many health benefits, including skeletal muscle adaptations that improve fat and glucose metabolism and insulin action, enhance endothelial function, have favorable changes in blood lipids, lipoproteins, and hemostatic factors, and reduce blood pressure, postprandial lipemia and glycemia, and pro-inflammatory markers. This, this, should be the focus of curbing the health risks of obesity. It's the exercise and good diet, not the weight loss, that improves health outcomes. To illustrate why this is so important, I'm going to use myself as an example. Two months ago, I weighed 215.9 pounds, which easily put me into the obese category. And before you comment something about BMI not taking into account muscle, come on, I know better, you know better, there's no shame in it. 
To get to what the CDC calls a healthy weight, I'd have to lose at least 60 pounds. With a weight loss of one to two pounds a week, which is the rate experts recommend, that would take more than six months at the absolute fastest, over a year on the low end, and that's assuming that everything goes according to plan, which it won't, and that I can perfectly estimate both my caloric intake and expenditure, which I can't. The point is, even if I do everything right, it is going to take a long time before the number on the scale says healthy. It's hard to stay motivated, which is necessary for any sort of consistency, when the perceived reward for putting up with something unpleasant is far off in the distance. Time is weird and our brains are bad. The importance we place on something is heavily correlated with its immediacy, and consequences are easy to ignore when they're merely future possibilities. A single bout of exercise can have favorable effects on your blood pressure, cognitive function, and mood. And it doesn't take very long at all for these effects to stick. But more importantly, doing the exercise is the good thing. Eating a meal with lean protein and vegetables is the good thing. These aren't means to an end or steps to take toward a goal. They are the goal. If you have another goal, like, say, fitting back into a pair of risque boxers you got on a vacation before the pandemic, then that has to be secondary. I can tell you from 10 years of training clients that if someone switches that order and makes diet and exercise mere tools to lose weight, they're the first thing to go if the weight loss starts to stall. And often, even when the weight loss was actually achieved. It's like, I passed the test, I don't have to study anymore. The goal was to learn, wasn't it? At the beginning of this year, I made a commitment to lose 32 pounds by my 32nd birthday. Two months later, and I'm halfway there with three months to go. But really, as is almost always the case with weight loss goals, there was something deeper driving that. I was chasing a feeling, one I hadn't had since I quit powerlifting years ago. I want to be a guy that can help you move. Someone not only capable enough to carry the heavy shit upstairs, but to do that for eight hours and still have the energy to celebrate a job well done that night. I've been that guy with a six pack and I've been that guy with a gut. After eight weeks of consistent, basic exercise and fewer frozen pizzas, I feel like I'm almost that guy again. And that's a way more exciting prospect than a number on a scale. When I get that feeling back, when I can look at 10 boxes of books I have to lug upstairs as a challenge rather than a symptom of hoarding that needs to be addressed, I've made it even if I gain all the weight back. And if I'm physically fit enough to feel that way, I'm probably as healthy physically as I am mentally. To recap, being fat in and of itself is more of a compounding factor than a primary one when it comes to the negative health consequences of obesity. The real factors are physical fitness and diet, but they're often framed as tools to target weight loss instead of the primary health determinants that they are. Too much emphasis placed on the scale can cause physical and mental problems that make long-term health harder to maintain. And considering that you could be fat and fit, it's worth examining if it wouldn't be better for everyone involved if our focus shifted to proper diet and exercise as the goal, with weight loss treated as an optional benefit if achieved. And that's... Nice, it's, it's good to know, but it doesn't actually fix anything, does it? I've essentially done the thing I lambasted at the beginning. I'm telling fat people to exercise, just with a shift in framing. That shift might help a few people recontextualize their understanding of obesity's relationship with morbidity, and if the stars align, maybe somebody somewhere will make fewer assumptions about a fat person's health, but those are problems for individuals. No matter how accurate, individual solutions for systemic problems never work. And if widespread knowledge of the importance of diet and exercise hasn't worked by now, it was never the solution to begin with. So what is driving this global rise in the factors and conditions that lead to obesity? In the next video, I'm going to talk about how the evils of late-stage capitalism created a system that both produces and hates fat people.